We today are going to uh, look at something that's dear to my heart, the latter rain. I've never preached a message on this that I can recall, and I'm glad for it because today I have a better understanding of what it means. Now I'm here with you in Michigan, but my family would like to say hello before we get started. I almost forgot to mention my two children, 18 and 15, are both in Mexico right now. They're doing a mission trip helping to build churches and they're doing, they're actually, my son was so nervous this morning. He said, we're going to be on TV and I'm singing. Or he has, he's actually playing the guitar. He's not singing, but he's part of the music. And so pray for us, you know, absolutely pray for him, you know. And so my son, 18 years old, my daughter, 15, we're having a great time. My kids are uh, my friends. We, we really have a good relationship and it's been a blessing. My wife as well is my dear friend. She's not with them. This is the first time my kids have gone away from us like that for a whole two weeks. Wow, right? Parents, you know what I'm talking about. And so um, pray for my dear children, but also my wife, she's in Tennessee waiting for the children to come back and then they're going to come this direction because my wife has some friends over there she's able to visit. And her sister ended up being there at the same time. So a whole bunch of family reunion and ministry and it's good. It's good to be alive. But we're at the end of time. Do you believe that? And I think at the end of time, we have heard many, many times, many, many times that the latter rain will help us to fulfill the ministry that God has called us to fulfill. Is that true? And so for us to be able to look at this topic, we know that it's coming. We know that we've heard it many times before. The drops are falling. There is actually like things that are occurring in the world where the latter rain is actually occurring. And then there's times where you hear that, you know, well, the latter rain, it, it'll come in the future and it's not really happening or else because there's going to be these amazing experiences. And, but, you know, I'm wondering more today about the mechanics of it. Okay, I'm not going to tell you all about what's going to happen, except it's going to be incredible. I was just talking with Tim as he was taking me from the airport to his, uh, where, where we're staying, his mother's and father's place. Um, we were talking and we both agree that there's going to be a time in the latter rain where it's really good. The gospel's going everywhere. People are accepting it. Like the, the enemy's going to be starting to stir and then it's going to turn really ugly. Okay. I believe that we're going to have a really good time for a short moment. The gospel's going to go come on, kind of like COVID around the world. It only took about three weeks. I remember, I remember being in my living room and saying, this thing has gone around the world in about three weeks. If you didn't pick that up back there about a year ago, that's what happened. And I'm thinking the gospel is going to go around the world in about three weeks. And so we're going to have a really good time for a short time. I don't know how long that will be, but then it's going to get ugly. So, but before that, we're going to rejoice in that we can be like this together and we can, we can hug and we can pray and we can see each other's faces and we can sing, right? It's good stuff in preparation for that time where we're going to be in heaven. Well, looking at the mechanics of the latter rain, what do I mean the mechanics? Well, how does it work? The latter rain. You know, like, how did the former rain work? What, what happened on the day of Pentecost? And so we're going to try to look at that in a few different perspectives and try to understand a little bit more of what it is that God is trying to reveal to his people. And if he wants to use his humble servant today to reveal to you something that you may not have heard before, praise the Lord. But I challenge you, do not leave this place saying that preacher doesn't know what he's talking about. Because I've done a lot of study, which today I'm going to give you kind of like the outcome of my study. I'm not going to lead you from the ground bottom all the way up. Okay, so I'm expecting that some of you, most of you, have heard some of what I've said before about the ideologies that we all have of the Holy Spirit, the ministration of God through His Son, the ministration of the elect angels that we just read about. We're going to try to put that all together in light of the latter rain. Now you can see that I've kind of changed it a little bit. The latter rain or the latter rain. And I think it's pretty interesting either way. You could really kind of interact both those thoughts together, the latter rain with the latter rain. And why would I say that? Well, because you've probably heard me talk about the ladder of Jacob's dream, right? In Genesis chapter 28, 
Does that have anything to do with the latter rain? You see, are you, you, you're picking up where I'm going. Some of you are like, brother, uh, Alberto's over there raised, you know, shaking his head. Yep, I get it. And so we're going to see a little bit of what the scripture says in this regard. Now, just this is still preface. I cannot cover all the details. It will be impossible in one message to cover this entire subject so that you leave, having never heard this before, potentially, saying, wow, that makes a lot of sense. But I think there will be enough here for you to be challenged to go and study further to see if what I have said is in accordance with the Bible or not. And that's being a good Berean, right? We all should be. So, the latter rain. Let's go now to the scripture. I'm going to have a lot of scripture, but I have notes as well. If you wanted me to send you the notes, feel free. I'll just email them to you. They will be on the internet uh, as soon as I can edit it, and then it'll be up for release not too long in the future. So, all of that said, let's look at Deuteronomy 11, verse 14. And what I did is I just looked up the two words, latter rain. If you use a, in fact, I'm just going to turn to it. If you use a, a Bible program like this one, it's called Accordance. You should be able to just literally tab, type in latter rain, and you'll be able to search that, those two words. And those two words will come up in every single verse in the Bible. Okay, that's what I did. So that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season. In his due season. Important. The first rain and the latter rain. That, here's, here's why. That thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. That's what it's for. That you will have a ripe harvest. Right? That's what it's for. According to our first verse, it is that you might have something to harvest or else you're going to reap everything and it's going to be green, right? So you don't want to reap stuff that's green. You guys know this over here in Michigan. I used to live in Michigan, actually. I lived here seven years. I used to be a pastor for those seven years that I was living here. I actually lived here like more, more like eight years. But um, anyways, so it goes on here in Job 29. The next time the Bible uses the two words together, latter and rain, they waited for me as for the rain. And they opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. So you've ever been a child outside when it's raining and you open up your mouth? And you're trying to catch those drops, right? That's what I picture here. And, you know, you don't really picture that when it's freezing cold outside. And, you, you know, you're not putting your head back trying to catch maybe snowflakes that way. But we're talking about raindrops here. So it's not cold here. It looks like this is a refreshing from the Lord, right? That's what the Bible calls it in Acts chapter, what, 2? A refreshing from the Lord? I think I'm getting that one wrong. It's some... Times of refreshing. The times of refreshing. Isn't that in Acts chapter 2? Okay. I, I'm, for some reason, I'm... It might be Acts 3. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know if it's 2 or not. Anyways, it's, it's in the beginning of the book of Acts. You can find it. Just use that program that I was sharing before, refreshing, Lord, and you'll find it. And so now, this to me, re it reflects a good time, like a time where you want to just tip back your head and open your mouth and catch those drops. Like, this is amazing. Look at this. It's raining. We need rain. Why? Because there's going to be a famine in the land, right? Not a famine of bread or of water, but of hearing of the word of the Lord. But this is going to be the time where the rains are coming down. So it's going to be like, yes, right? Well... Proverbs 16, 15, in light of the king's countenance is life. We know who the king is, right? And his favor is as a, what's the next word? Cloud of the latter rain. Wait a minute. Clouds? There needs to be clouds in order to be the latter rain? Well, that makes sense, right? Good question. What are clouds symbolic of in the Bible? Angels, thank you. <laughs> so wait a minute. If we have been talking about the latter rain, and we haven't been talking about from whence the rain comes, maybe we've missed something. You see what I'm saying? The clouds bring the rain. 
That makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, you, you could ask any farmer. And they'll say, what do you need in order to get the rain? Well, he, he, somewhere down that list, he's going to say clouds. And so if clouds are in the sky, what does that mean? It means it's going to be kind of dark, right? Because the sun is being shut out by the clouds that have rain within them. And so there's darkness. And we know that that's symbolic of evil in the world. We know that the earth is very dark right now. Not that the sun isn't shining here in beautiful Michigan. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm now being uh, symbolic here. We have the darkness of evil in the world. And what we want is rain to come from those clouds. Okay. It says there in Jeremiah 3, Therefore the showers have been withholden. Why? There's been no latter rain. Why? Because thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Who is Jeremiah talking about in Jeremiah 3? Israel. He's talking to Israel. That's exactly right. Who today is Israel? Those that claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. There's all kinds of Israelites in the Israel of today. But there is a real Israel, not that Israel that's just of the flesh, as Paul was talking about in the book of Romans, but those that have actually been circumcised in heart, and they have the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. These are the Israelites, okay? And those are the ones that we're supposed to be bringing the gospel to the world, but they have a whore's forehead. What does that mean? Go to Revelation 17, verse 5. And what, what will you find there? On the whore's forehead, she is the mother of harlots. And you'll find the name of blasphemy there. So, I mean, this is a heavy sentence here in the book of Jeremiah relating directly to God's people on the earth. Okay, Jeremiah 5, he didn't get any easier on them. Jeremiah 5 and 6 are pretty heavy. Neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. So they're not saying this. That gives rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. We've already seen that before, right, in Deuteronomy, in his season. You don't want to send the rain too soon. Why? Because it will ruin the crops. You don't want to send the, the rain too late because it will what? Ruin the crops. You've got to send it right at the right time. The mercy of the Lord comes with the latter rain at the right time to bring everything to harvest. And Christ will come. And Revelation 14, right after the three angels' messages, will be fulfilled. The voices from heaven will say, reap, for the time of the harvest has come. And it is time for thee to reap. And there will be that threshing instrument that will come, right? We know all that visually in Revelation chapter 14. Well, in his season. Well, now wait a minute. In his season. Does this mean we need to be looking at the feasts and seeing all the calendars and checking all that stuff? I mean, like, is that really the focus of this in his season theme? Well, I've got a question for you. If that's true, why? Hear me now. Why does the Bible say he will cut the work short in righteousness? That doesn't sound like in his season to me, as far as timing is concerned and, and the calendar necessarily. It sounds like he's going to do it when it's time for him. Right? So, oh, I, I better not get too excited up here, right? Is that what I'm seeing? So in his season, yes, we can go and, and understand that God has done everything according to his timing. I mean, like, who would have known except through prophecy that 1844 was going to be a big deal on October 22nd, right? There was a lot of study that came as a result of that, but we won't be able to know the day or the hour of Christ's coming. Why? Because it's not going to come at the time we expect. It's going to be cut short in righteousness, and God will send his angels along with his son to bring us back to where he is waiting. Yes, he is waiting. Revelation chapter 8 verse 2 is what I'm or 8 verse 1 is what I'm referring to. So then it says in verse, uh, is it? Yeah, it's 8 verse 1. So here, from our perspective, we wait for the rain, but for God, he controls the rain. Remember, he will cut short his work in righteousness, so earth's time will not be fully expended. Okay? God is going to cut short the work. That means the time will not completely be fulfilled or full as we would expect. So Romans 9, 28, he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. That's what the Bible teaches. 
So you've got to put those two things together. So those that are really interested in the times and the seasons, you have to bring in the idea that God's going to cut it short. It doesn't say God will wait until one of those dates. It's not what it says. So then right here in, Ver in Hosea 6, it, this is talking about the resurrection, the three days, etc., as it was just described in verse 2. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His goings forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain. Who shall come to us? He shall come to us. Who's that? Well, the Lord, right? God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. And so when it says that he will come as the rain, he is the one that's coming as the rain. As the latter and the former rain unto the earth. So this is going to be a message about Christ. It's going to be a message about Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what it's all about. That's what it's always been about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here's that latter and uh, the word rain in the same verse again. Notice it says in Joel, Be glad then, and ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. Now, just to make sure we understand, the former rain moderately, that means I gave it to you a little bit, but he doesn't clarify that when he's talking about the latter rain. The latter rain is going to be no holds barred, if you're interested in wrestling, right? <laughs> that's, that's where that phrase comes from, I think. So then we have this word month. You'll see it's, it's actually uh, italicized. The reason being I did that because the Bible actually italicizes that word as well. Meaning it's not in the original language. The translators just wanted you to understand that probably in the context, this is what it means. We run into that problem as well with Daniel chapter 8, right? And the daily sacrifice. The word sacrifice shouldn't be there. And so the, uh, I just want to go back to our previous finding in Hosea 6. It says that he shall come unto us as the rain. Who's he in the context? Well, it's the Lord, right? So then, if you're thinking about he coming unto us, and then it says that the latter rain, the former and the latter rain will come in the first month, you know, it could work. I agree, it could work. But in light of the last verse, it could also say in the first begotten. So the rain, the former and the latter rain will come in the first begotten son. You see what I'm saying? Because he will come to you as the rain. And so that word month is there, but it could also be understood in the fact that maybe it's not talking about timing, though it does fit in the context. I'm just suggesting that that could be understood as well as the one who is coming instead of when it's coming, right? Zechariah chapter 10, we're going to look at this one a little bit later too, but it says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So we're supposed to know what time it is, right? So yeah, we're supposed to know. We can see by the scripture itself about the time that the Lord will be coming. We're not in darkness regarding this. Just ask Paul when he was writing to the Thessalonians in chapter 5. So the Lord shall make bright, what? Clouds. And give them showers of rain. So the Lord is going to give clouds, bright clouds. He's going to make them. And give them showers of rain. Who are the clouds again? The clouds are the angels. And so the Lord is going to send angels with something, with the rain. What is the rain? Well, we know that the water of life represents that which was in the life of Jesus, right? So we have the water of life that the Lord gives to the clouds so that the clouds will be able to have showers of rain. And so again, the same thing that we've seen numbers of times in the Bible, specifically, for example, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. I'm just going to go there. Revelation 1. And the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. But we need to clarify that statement to understand how it got there. God gave it unto him. So God gave it to Jesus Christ. And it was to show his servants unto think the things which must shortly come to pass. He, the one that had the gospel, which was Jesus Christ, give it, given it to him by the Father, he sent and signified it by, what? His angel unto his servant John. 
And that's why, for example, in Revelation 22, verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Jesus simply says it at the close, I sent my angel to you to share these things in the churches. And that's why it's so important in the seven churches to understand what's being said there and how it's being said. Christ said he sent his angel. Okay? So that's what's happening there. And so in Zechariah, we're to ask the Lord for the rain in the time of the latter rain. When we know that the Lord is, has told us through prophecies and explanations and signs and wonders that the Lord is about to come. Jesus Christ is about to come to take us to where his Father is. We should be asking for the rain. Because it's right about time for harvest, don't you think? The harvest is supposed to be ready. And when the harvest is ready, the latter rain doesn't come over a period of months. No, it comes in a day. The rain comes down, boom! Now, I don't know how long it lasts, because I'm sure that lasts differently, how long it will be raining, but we're going to know that the rain has come. And so, ask the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds, or he will give this brightness to the angels, and give them showers of rain to, one, to everyone grass in the field. And that's what it's going to do. It's going to produce life in the fields. What is the field? According to Matthew chapter 13, it's the world. God is going to send his angels that are clouds, and they are going to rain upon us. You hear what I'm saying? Now, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Ask me a question, because I don't want you to leave here thinking that I'm crazy. I could maybe, maybe not totally, but maybe clarify a little bit in your mind if, in fact, you do have a question. Like, wait a minute, I thought that was the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Yes, he sends that through his spirit, which is in the angels. Okay? And that's where the clouds are. That's how they fit in. So the, the angels are not the Holy Spirit. The angels are the vessels of the Holy Spirit, just like you are a vessel of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Trees... Bushes, plants, flowers are not vessels of the Holy Spirit. God is not in the, the trees, the flowers and the, the leaves. And neither is God an essence pervading all nature, kind of like wind or breath. That is a symbol of the Spirit moving, because basically in the context of Jesus in John chapter 3, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, you know, the, the wind comes... And you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going, but you know it's there. Why? How? Because the trees are moving, right? If there's movement in the life of a person toward God, the spirit is there. The wind is blowing. If there's no movement in that person's life, the spirit of God is not there. That's what's being said. Okay? So it's not saying that God is a spirit, like a floaty thing, and my friend... <laughs> My friend in California mentioned to me after a sermon I presented just a short time ago called The Omnipresence, Thoughts on Omnipresence. She said, that seals it. There is no floaty thing. I get it. <laughs> and that really made sense to me because I used to believe in that floaty thing. You know what I mean? And so the, the floaty thing is not a spirit which is an essence pervading all nature and somehow God is in the room because his spirit is here. God has gifted his soldiers, the angels, with the responsibility of taking his thoughts, his character, his mind, his life, his will to his people on the earth. And so if you're understanding anything right now, it's based on the word that we're reading, because the word is spirit and the word is life. And the angels are helping you actually preparing your hearts so that those seeds will plant and produce some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Okay. The angels have a major role in doing service for God's people. Sister. Yes. Amen. The comment was that she's seeing how important it is to be fully surrendered in order to be able to receive the oil that pours forth from those golden um, tubes and we'll be able to be filled and fully gods, not just partially. We can't be one foot in the world, one foot on the, in the kingdom, because it doesn't work that way, right? 
So thank you for the comments. If there are more questions, please interrupt me. James 5, verse 7. Be patient, like the patience of the saints. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits. The husbandman is waiting. Why? For the precious fruit of the earth. That's why it hasn't come yet. He is patient and waiting for you and for me. So it's the husbandman is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until the fruit of the earth or he received the early and the latter rain. That's why it's not here. Okay? Because we're not ready yet. And he's, he doesn't want to send the rain too early because he's going to destroy the crop. He's waiting. He's merciful and waiting. You see how loving he is? He's not just saying, you know what? There's enough wickedness in the world. I'm just going to wipe it all out. I mean, he's going to do that one day, but he's waiting for one more soul. And what if that's you? What if that's me? What if you do have one foot in the world? Get it out. Today. Make that decision. So then now, this, these, I made this big old thing here, which only took up one line earlier, but I made the font bigger, so it took up three. And uh, so there's no symbolism there. <laughs> But what we do have, just real quick, what we do have is every scripture so far that includes the words ladder and rain. And that's what you've just seen. Sister, go ahead, Elizabeth. Where, where'd you get that? That's James chapter 5, verse 7. And so now Deuteronomy 31, verse 2. Notice what it says. Give ear, O ye heavens, I will speak. Okay, what are you listening to when he says, give ear, I will speak? Voice. You're listening to his voice, his words, right? Not, not just his voice necessarily, because he could be humming. He is actually speaking words. That's the, that's the purpose of this thought. Give ear, ye heavens, I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. That's how it prefaces this in Deuteronomy 32. Notice verse, 30, uh, verse 2 now. My doctrine. What is doctrine? Teaching. My teaching, my doctrine, my words, listen to the, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop how? As the rain. Where does rain come from? From the clouds. Yes, from heaven, but it's from the clouds as well. We've already established that before. The Lord's going to give bright clouds, and from those bright clouds will be showers that are given, right? So, my doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain, which is like the early former rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers, like the latter rain, upon the grass. You see how that works? Now, what's the context here? God is speaking. He is sending his doctrine. That's what the rain is. That's the water of life. It's the word of God. My spirit, I'm sorry, my words are spirit and they are true life. John 6, verse 63, right? So we continue on in verse 3. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. How are they going to publish? Well, in books, on YouTube, and Facebook, and texting, and all sorts of ways he's going to publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. And so here we have the words of the Lord coming down as rain. Okay, so the word is spirit, the word is life. How does that come to us? It comes to us through the ministration of God's servants, his ministers. That's what Hebrews chapter 1, verses 7 and 14 says. We'll read that in a bit. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, so like at the timing, right? They were all with one accord and in one place. It's really difficult to be of one accord. You know that, don't you? I, you have no idea how many times I've had people call or text or email me and have said, you're a leader in the movement. Why can't you bring unity? I'm like, yeah, I don't have the tools to pull everybody's teeth. I just don't, I don't have that. Yes, sir. It's his, it's his job to bring the unity you ask for. Right, yeah, that's our business. If we are converted, personally, if I'm converted, we will be unified. Amen. If there's somebody unconverted, we won't be unified. The two do not work together. We need to be 100% converted to God as the elders were charged today before God, before his son and the elect angels, if we can co-work with them as we are commanded to do in Christ's Object Lessons 283.1, if we are able to do that, then we will be unified. And 
Describe the definition of unity. Okay, I would say that if we all have, there's a really good quote. Let me see, unity quote. Let me see if I can just find it real quick. There it is, boom. All right, we, um, let's see. We must make it appear essential to be united, okay? Not that we are requiring others to come to our ideas. That's not what unity is. But if all are seeking the meekness and lowliness of Christ, they will have the mind of Christ. And if everybody has the mind of Christ, we're going to be unified. Amen. And so then there will be unity of spirit. Okay, that to me is one of the best quotes on unity that I've ever found. Because to me it makes it so simple. If we can have the mind of Christ. Not my own will that I'm right and you're wrong. The mind of Christ. Like, hey, wait a minute. Maybe I don't understand yet. But God wants to teach me more. Let's do this. Right? That's what we're looking for. And if we can do it. There is, yeah, like, like it says right here. It must not be essential to be united. We must not have that. But at the same time, we shouldn't be rebellious saying, hey, I think this way, you can think that way. That's not unity, that's, that's division, right? So we, we have to be very willing to say, let's all come at the same point, which is the mind of Christ. Whatever I do, whatever I say, whatever I believe, I surrender. May it be the mind of Christ that we all have. So that's really what it is. Thank you for asking. And so they were all in one accord in one place. Now, I don't know if at the end of time we're all going to have to be in one place or not. Can we all be in one place virtually, like through the internet? I don't know. Do we all have to come like to a GC-ish where we're all together in one place in order for this to happen? I don't know. I don't think so. Because that's like, that'd be pretty difficult to get everybody together that are believers in the, in the whole world, you know, in one place. But I'm thinking that the one place there could reflect like a one place as far as even the internet can, you know, the, uh, I don't really know what it means. Go ahead. One place, that's the place. Okay, the, the mind of Christ could be the place, sure. I've often, I've often said in my studies, the mind seems to be a place, like a literal place, where demons can be in your mind. They're not inside your body. They're not literally, like, controlling your arms or your mouth. They're controlling your mind. And as they're in that mind, as they control it, they have your arms, they have your mouth, they have your eyes. So it's like the remote control, if you will. You're not in the box itself, you're in that little remote, and you're controlling that remote. That's the mind, if you will. So anyways, verse 2. Suddenly, right away, the last movements will be rapid ones. There came the sound. That's the first thing it says. There was a sound. A sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, I'll just tell you, angels, according to the Bible, have wings. And those wings will make a sound. You can read about it in Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10. Those, I mean, think about it. You've heard birds before. There are some birds that are more quiet than others, like the owl, but I'm referring to actual birds that have big wings. They make a lot of noise. And so, I'm not saying that the angels are birds, but they do have wings, right? So I'm making an equation here. And so there's the sound. That's the first thing that we read about is the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the people. Is that what it says? No, it filled all the house. Okay. So there was an actual something that was there that was filling the house. What was that? Was that the floaty thing? No, it was the spirit of God in the angels that had been sent by God through his son, the only mediator between heaven and earth. And that's where they were descending on that ladder. And they had a mission to do at that time. And just what you read in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, they're going to have a mission to do at the end of time as well. And it's going to be the glory of the Lord that's able to fill the earth. And that glory has been given to an angel. You can read about it. Go to uh, early writings for yourself. It's not Christ. It's an angel. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. This idea of cloven, I like that. You know what cloven is, right? Something that's split into two. Why are there cloven tongues? It's not like a candle. If, you, if that was a candle, you would see one flame. But here, we need to see two flames. Okay, it doesn't say three, it says two. Why cloven? Why two? I believe what we're experiencing here is 
a symbol of, because, you know, our, the, the whole people unified are the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? Who's on the throne of the temple? The Father and the Son. So if we have a flame that is cloven, we have two. And if those cloven tongues are on the temple, all of us being individual uh, stones that have been chipped and sawn and cut and beaten, prepared for this time, if the temple has been built and there are cloven tongues sitting on the mind of those that are receiving the word, it seems to me like it's the Father and the Son as a reference. Okay. So now these cloven tongues are there and it's a rushing mighty wind. They're filling the house. What is this? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's, uh, that's the various noises in Ezekiel 1 and 10. Psalm 104 verse 3, God, he lays the beams of his chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. Now notice what it says, clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. Okay, so now here, the angels are a flaming fire. That's what it says. The angels are spirits, and his ministers, which are the angels, are a flaming fire. That's why in the Old Testament, you have the Shekinah glory representing the Father, you have the high priest, which is representing the Son, and then you have all the priests representing the angels. And those outside of the ministry of the priests are those that are representing those on the earth. Okay? So the Father, the Son, and the angels are represented in the ministry there in the sanctuary. And what happened on the earthly sanctuary is what's going on in heaven, right? And so you have the Father, the Shekinah glory, you have the high priest, and you have the priests, which are the Father, Son, and the angels. And that's what's happening here as well. He makes bright clouds his chariot. Very important to understand because we go here and we notice that Paul quoted Psalm 104, the angels he makes uh, them into spirits and his ministers are a flame of fire. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth? What is that sent forth? Go ahead and read Revelation 5 verse 6 and you realize that the Spirit of God was sent forth into all the earth. How did that happen? Right here. The ministering spirits were sent forth with the mind and will and teaching abilities of God. And they came down on uh, the apostles there into that room with their fluttering wings and they represented themselves as cloven tongues on the foreheads of those that were in Pentecost or in the, the room together. It says they were sent, the ministering spirits were sent to minister, which the word minister means to aid, to teach, to serve, to officiate, or to be part of the office, for them who shall be heirs of salvation. As we continue, the, notice what we have here with the idea of clouds. Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. What happened to Moses when he was in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights surrounded by the clouds? What happened? His face was bright. His face was bright, yes. But what else happened? He received something. What did he receive? He received the Ten Commandments, exactly. And so notice what it says in chapter 3, verse 19 of Galatians. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of the transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it, which is the law, was ordained. That word ordained means appointed, commanded, given, set in order by angels in the hand of a mediator. What does that mean? So God was with his son on the mount. Uh, we can read in Patriarchs and Prophets, they were both there. It was the, the son that was speaking the law of the father. So that was the voice that was heard was God's voice through his son. And we know that what happened is that the mediator, which is Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and men, the mediator was able to appoint, give, or set in order the law by angels as the mediator. So the mediator gave the law by angels into the hand of Moses. That's what it's saying. It says a very similar thing in uh, Acts chapter 7 as well. You have to read it for yourself. I didn't find that verse. So rain, by God's design, comes with the clouds. And the clouds are angels, right? There's, there's another one that I think I may have missed, but I'm just going to look it up. It's uh, Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000. So we know that, let's just look at that again. It says up here that God makes the clouds his chariot, right? Okay, you remember that? That's in the Psalms. Well, let's look at the Psalms elsewhere. The chariots, which we know are 
the clouds. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So the chariots are angels. And so when Elijah ascended to heaven, leaving Elisha, what was he taken in? Chariots. chariots. What does that mean? Angels. angels, right? So that's the same way Christ came, or rather went from earth to heaven. He went in the clouds of heaven. And just as you saw him go into heaven, you will see him come back to earth with the clouds, with the angels. And so Christ, according to the Bible, he doesn't float around. He is taken by angels. Okay. Now Christ can walk. We all know that because we've seen that in the story there in the, the book of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We see him also walking with the disciples there in the book of Acts. But the clouds are the ones that take him from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. That's the, uh, the idea that's being pictured there. So going back to our section here, um, Zechariah, let's just peek at this. We're almost done here. He answered and said unto me, this is the word of the Lord. So here, this is the word unto Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith who? You, you said the Lord, but what does it say? The Lord of hosts. Now, why in that context, when he says, this is the word of the Lord, says the Lord of hosts? Why did he say Lord of hosts? He could have said Lord of heaven. He could have said Lord of earth. He could have just said Lord. He could have said Lord of lords. But he said Lord of hosts. Why? Who are the hosts? The angels. This is the word of the Lord says the Lord of hosts. It's very important, I think, to understand because he was purposefully using these phraseology so that we can understand that the hosts are involved here. And read the rest of Zechariah 4. You'll see it. It's pretty amazing. It's kind of like what we went through earlier in Revelation 1. God gave it unto him, which is his son. He gave it to an angel, and the angel gave it to John. Now watch this. It's the same thing in the book of Daniel. I heard one saint speaking. I'm going to suggest that saint was Christ. In the book of Daniel... Chapter 8? Yes, watch. I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, this word certain here is um, bolded. Why? Because if you triple click that word, you'll find that it's the only time that it, that Hebrew word is used in the Bible. That certain saint. So there's one saint speaking, and another saint said to that certain saint which spake, he said, how long shall be the vision concerning the sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he, which was Gabriel, said unto me, after he got the answer, unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it came to pass when I, I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. I would suggest that is Christ. Here's why. Notice the next verse. And I heard a man's voice, still Christ, between the banks of Uli, which is where he was when he had the vision. You can read that in verse 1. Which called and said, so this is the man that has a man's voice. He called and said, Gabriel, make this man, which is Daniel, to understand the vision. Now, okay, according to the Bible, who has authority above Gabriel? Christ and the Father, right. And so this is the appearance of a man with a man's voice. Who would that be that has authority over Gabriel? Christ, not the Father. The Father doesn't have the appearance of a man with a man's voice, right? Nobody's heard the voice of the Lord before, except through his Son. And so here what we have is Christ commanding Gabriel, make Daniel to understand. What do we have in Daniel chapter 3? We have the same exact thing that happened in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. We can suggest, and I think rightly so, that God the Father gave a message to his son, who gave it to an angel, who gave it to Daniel. Right? So the same thing's happening again. Why? Because Daniel needed to be educated. That's how you, too, are educated. It's by the Spirit of God through the ministration of holy angels. Okay? That's how Miller learned as well. Uh, verse. Now we're going to go back to Zechariah because we already talked about this idea of um, this is the word of the Lord and it's said by the Lord of hosts. It says in verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel the, have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it 
and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. Wait a minute. The Lord of hosts sent me unto you? Who's the me that's talking? It's the angel, right? I don't know who it is. It's likely Gabriel, but I'm not sure. But what's the point is, we just read about the Lord of hosts in a previous verse, in verse 6, and the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you, because I'm one of the host. You see, he's my Lord, that's what he's saying. For who has despised the day of small things? Small things. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. This is the judgment setting we're talking about. With those seven. They, the seven, are the eyes of the Lord. I do have a presentation on this, the eyes of the Lord. And I concluded with that study. You could conclude differently if you'd like to, but at least you could look at what I've presented. I have a message online called the eyes of the Lord. And I concluded that they are representative of the angelic ministry. Okay? So those seven being the eyes of the Lord, what do they do? They run to and fro through the whole earth. That's the angels. You can just look up the phrase run to and fro and find out that angels are involved. Satan is one that runs to and fro throughout the earth, right? Like a, a, a lion seeking whom he may devour. But also in the Old Testament, when you ask Job, hey, what was Satan like? Well, he was going down in the earth running to and fro. Okay? So the angels are doing that going to and fro. That's what the Bible says. In fact, that's what Sister White describes as well in a message I just presented not long ago, referring to the uh, thoughts on omnipresence. Zechariah 4.11. Then I answered and said, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? I would suggest to you they are the Father and the Son, but there's no answer given. The angel does not answer the question, who are the two olive trees? There's no answer. And so like in that awkward moment where he asked a question and there's no answer, he's like, um, so I answered again and said, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Ah, now he's going to get an answer. And he answered, and he said, what, you don't know what these be? And he said, well, no, Lord, you, you know, I don't. And he says in verse 14, then he answered and said, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, why in the same context did he use Lord of hosts twice, but now it's Lord of the earth? Because those two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth are representative of the ministration of angels that go up and down the ladder to the earth. You see what I'm saying? Study it for yourself. Zechariah 4 is powerful. That is a very critical chapter to understand better whence, from whence that holy oil comes. It's, yes, from the Father and the Son, but that's not what he was trying to describe. He was trying to describe, this is the word of the Lord, saith the Lord of hosts. And so he's like, wow, where are these, what are these two trees? He's like, mm, -mm. Okay, what about the, uh, the, the branches and the olive, you know, those, those pipes that come down to, that fill the candlesticks? Like, what's that about? These are the angels that are sent from the Lord of the whole earth. Okay, that's what he was trying to get Zechariah to see and understand. And so, this doesn't glorify the angels. This glorifies the Lord of hosts and the Lord of the earth that sends those angels. This is the way he does ministry. And it's, remember, those bright clouds that he fills with rain, and he sends those clouds. This is called the latter rain. How does the rain come? From clouds. What are clouds? They're angels. Where do the angels come from? From the Lord of hosts. And he sends them. And so, Zechariah chapter 10, this is that verse again. Ask ye the Lord in the time of the latter rain. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. All of this stems from this one section of the Bible. Two more verses and we're done. He dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. That ladder, if you ask John in chapter 1, verse 51, represents Jesus. Jesus said, I am that ladder. Basically, he said, the angels will ascend and descend upon the Son of Man, me. So he dreamed and behold a ladder, which is Christ. He was set up on the earth. That means he's 100% human, just like we are. And the top of it reached unto heaven, which means he's 100% divine like his father is. And there's this, there's this mysterious combination that is unified, but there's like this difference. One is earthly, one is heavenly. And then you have there the top of it reaching to heaven, the bottom of it reaching to the earth. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. Jesus put himself there as the son of man in John chapter 1, verse 51. 
And it says in verse 13, Behold, the Lord stood above it, saying, I am the Lord God of Abraham. So who would that Lord be? That's the Father. Why? Because the Son is represented as the latter. The Father is standing above, and He is, if you just study what the Bible says about who the Lord God of Abraham is, it is the Father. And so the Father, He's saying, The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. That's the message that the Father speaks from above the ladder. And the angels were supposed to descend to Jacob having the dream upon that ladder. And so the Father speaks, the angels descend, they give the message to Jacob, and then they come back with the answer. That's the descending and the ascending. Okay, That's what's being described here. There's one mediator between God and man. It's the ladder, Jesus Christ, touching all the way up to heaven, to the very divine throne of God, all the way to the earth, from the very womb of, of the virgin. And so you have this expanse illustrated by that ladder. And the angels are the ones coming up and down. They're the ones that bring the message of God right there from his mouth to humanity. And so the message that I wanted to proclaim today was and is that God has helped us to understand, at least my mind, I don't know, I can't speak for everybody, but it's, he's helped me to understand that the reason why the holy angels, listen to me now, the reason why the holy angels are mentioned in the third angel is because the ministration of the holy angels is important during the time of the third angel. Are you with me? Okay, I'll say it again. The reason why holy angels are specifically mentioned in the third angel's message is because during the time of the third angel's message, the angelic ministry is extremely important. I think we need to understand what God is doing. We're told in the Great Controversy that we need to understand God's government. Sin, His government, and His character. We need to understand what sin is, what His government is, and what His character is. And those three things right here, one of which today we're talking about, we're talking about how God governs the universe. He does it through His Son, and His Son uses angels. And if you're part of that ministry, you will be ministered to by angels. I'm going to see if I can find something here. Um, this is a really important quote that I want to look up. I, I went ahead and studied this concept in Christ Object Lessons. I found God, Christ, and the word angel with an asterisk behind it. And so in the book, Christ Object Lessons, and I found 14 paragraphs, one of which is this. I'm going to just find it. Here it is. I'm going to just uh, make that bigger so everybody can read it with me there or sorry thus we are to serve god how she actually answers in the next uh, sentence he only serves who acts up to the highest standard of obedience okay that's how we're to serve god is fully 100 percent. all who would be sons and daughters of god must prove themselves co-workers with god and christ and the heavenly angels this is the test for every soul. Amen. Yes, amen. Thank you for saying that. The reason why is because this right here is in a book she wanted to go to the Gentiles. Yes. Christ Object Lessons, she donated the, the income of that book so that it can be published and sent, and I think to schools too, but that was for the purpose, so that young people could do Cole Porter ministry and this book could go to the Gentiles. That sounds like an Adventist statement, doesn't it? Yeah. This is a Gentile statement. We need to teach them about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Angels. And guess what message includes that? It's the third angel. That's amazing, isn't it? So we're waiting for the latter rain, and I believe it's starting to be time with our understanding to actually comprehend how God will do it. Read Revelation 18. It's the angel that comes with the glory that lightens the world, and that is not a symbolic angel. That's a real one. And yes, it represents the message, but it also represents an angel who, after he's done, he comes back to heaven and he says, Lord, I have done what you've commanded me to do. You can read it in, in early writings. And so, may we take more seriously asking of the Lord rain at the time of the latter rain.
Amen. 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 Shall we bow together and ask God to have mercy on us, to continue to teach us?